Hello, and welcome back to another special Patreon episode of What Went Wrong Below the Line with Chris Winterbauer and, as always, my lovely co-host, Lizzie Bassett. Lizzie, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing great. I'm very, very excited about our guest today. As am I. Uh, today, guys, you have the pleasure of listening to Dave Kamites. Dave Kamites has been a local 600A camera steady cam operator for over 20 years. He has won two Primetime Emmy Awards. He was nominated for an SOC Operator of the Year Award in 2013 for the film St. Vincent. He won that same award, I believe I'm getting this right, this year for his work on Ozark Season 4. It would eat up an episode reading his credits, but here are a few of my personal favorites, uh, Dave, if you'll indulge me. From Dusk Till Dawn, ER... Donnie Darko, I have a question about a specific shot in that movie, <laughs> Jurassic Park 3, Wedding Crashers, The West Wing, Beginners, Shame, Moonrise Kingdom, The Heat, Boardwalk Empire, The Good Wife, The Americans, Lucifer, and The Tragedy of Macbeth. Uh, it's, uh, he, again, check out his IMDb. Insane. The list goes on way <laughs> longer than that. Dave, welcome to What Went Wrong. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's it's an honor to talk to you guys. I'm a huge fan of the show. And um, that was interesting because I was wondering what, what you were going to pull out. And you pulled out most of the usual suspects, but you actually didn't pull out one that I assumed you would. I thought you were going to pull out Tremors. You know, <gasps> how did you not? <laughs> I missed it. I must well, here, have missed no, it. No, but here's the thing. Now that I think about it, you looked on IMDb. I did. Tremors was the first thing I ever did, oh. and I did I did miniature vis visual effects. I worked with <gasps> Bob and Denny Skotak, and we did yeah. all the worms. And remember that great sequence where um, the worm slams through the uh, the, yes, the retaining the wall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You broke so into the we, and they're just grabbing guns room. off the wall. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I don't know if you remember it, but there's like it's like it slams in, and then there's a whip pan over to yes. Michael Gross yes. and Reed yeah. McIntyre. Um, we built that whole that whole miniature room. Amazing. I remember, I remember like taking because i had no idea what i was doing and they were like go make pepsi cans and so i, I was like taking pictures <laughs> of pepsi cans and like cutting them out and putting them around these little rings i still have one on the desk here somewhere actually yeah amazing but, that was, but now i now I, I i i will forgive you that because it's actually not on the main thank list, you because so, yeah. that's a classic i love <laughs> that love that one movie. of my favorite movies it's a great, <laughs> I love great Tremors. film I, and and i i will say also um it's i i knew you would pick out donnie darko because it doesn't make a difference what I do with the rest of my life. No. Everybody will want to talk about Donnie Darko. <laughs> it, listen, it's a... I, I rewatched it. Because I, I saw it when I was 17. Sure. And I had the, you know, oh my God, my life will never be the same again. I am a 17-year-old white male <laughs> um, moment. But then I rewatched it recently and I was surprised at how well it, it held up. It, I think it is an incredible uh, film with a great it, tone. It but. Is, it, it's a great we, I don't want to rat hole yep. on Donnie Darko quite yet because we have a lot to get through sure. with well, you, Dave. We do. And I also will do my very best not to rat hole on Justified City Primeval, which I saw as your upcoming credit <laughs> because I'm a big fan. But yeah. we, we I, don't I, have I to hope, get caught up I in hope that. We didn't, I hope we didn't, we didn't disappoint you. You'll have to tell me after you see it. <laughs> I, I'll give you she a will. very harsh review. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Please do. Uh, no, actually, I think it's going to be good. The only thing that was interesting about that was uh, when did you may know when did that show go off the air? Like, oh my Justified? gosh, I want a long say, time like, ago, right? Like. 2011 is that right yeah so the weird thing was like we just we just shot it last summer and it was trying to convince them that you can't make the same tv show that was being made in yeah. 2011 because mm -hmm. tv has massively massively changed right yeah mm. um anyway yeah yeah <laughs> uh dave i realize there's one question that we should have put first on our question list so i hope this doesn't catch you out of left field but the very first question you are a steadicam operator Yes. To anyone who does not know, <laughs> yeah. what is a Steadicam and what does a Steadicam operator do? Okay, so uh, I'll back into it. The Steadicam operator operates the Steadicam. Great. And the Steadicam <laughs> is this um, gizmo that was created by Garrett Brown, uh, who is an amazing inventor. Um, and um, basically, the, the, short, the, the long short story of it is that uh, you know, cameras used to be massive and then they got smaller and people put them on their shoulder and ran around with them. 
And they, that was the only way they could really move them freely, if you want, not on dolly track. And so they came up with a French word for it called cinema verite because it was better than saying handheld. <laughs> and uh, Garrett was messing around. It was like, there's got to be a better way to do this. And he came up with this system that's a three-part system, basically. And uh, there's a vest that, that attaches to your body. So it basically becomes like an exoskeleton. And there's an arm that sort of is, it has two parts to it with springs in it that looks like one of those arms that hangs off of like an architect's desk that you can put the, you know, the lamp wherever you want. That's conceptually like it is. Uh, and that sort of acts as your forearm. And that attaches to the steady cam, which has a three-way moving gimbal. And so the idea is that you can put a camera on it and wait it out correctly and blah, blah, blah. And if you know what you're doing, you can run through a house with it. You can walk upstairs with it. You can go anywhere a human being can go more or less. Um, and make it look smooth. So, uh, you know, a, a great example that most people know is uh, ER or West Wing. Those were mm -hmm. big, you know, camera moving shows. And ER was the show actually um, that I've been skating off of my entire career that I was, I, I got on very young somehow I don't, and didn't screw it up. Uh, and um, it was sort of the first show that kind of made Steadicam not a specialty tool, but like a full part of every production. And now right. you, you really don't go on shows without without uh, seeing a Steadicam. By the way, um, at the beginning of my reel and at the end of my reel, there's a video of me at the Emmys on there where you can see me uh, wearing the Steadicam. And then there's a little movie that explains what it is probably better than I just did. Check that out. And really quickly, too, uh, to our audience members... If you've seen Aliens, you have actually seen a Steadicam because the suit that some of the soldiers wear with the converted MG42 machine gun hanging off the side of it, uh, that's actually a converted Steadicam with a prop machine gun attached, a World War II machine gun attached. So you've seen a Steadicam. And of course, there are innumerable, you know, famous shots, Steadicam shots, uh, Goodfellas, uh, the Shining, yep. obviously, and Dave, we'll, we'll get into him, but you've seen the work of the Steadicam. And like Dave said, the operator can go places that Dolly Track can't, and it looks smooth. And that exactly. was a remarkable uh, creation. And do you remember, that was 1970? It, uh, the movie it was in the was, 70s. The movie, uh, it's the Woody Guthrie story, and I always forget the name of the movie that it first came out on, but... Um, uh, Garrett did this shot that was a step off of a crane into a crowd. It'll come back to me at some point. I can't think of the name. Great. But um, and apparently when they showed it, like people just lost their minds. Like now mm -hmm. we can't conceptualize it because it's just like we're so used to cameras going everywhere. But back then it was like, what's happened? Exactly. exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Had the camera just a ghost picked it up off of the uh, crane yep. and carried it forward. Yeah. It, no which people. Is people just couldn't couldn't get their heads around how it was done. So which is he, yeah. It's amazing. It was literally, literally something that he like locked himself in a motel for three weeks, messing around with ideas, and came up with this idea and put together a videotape of like him running around, which you can see on the internet. You can see it on way. YouTube, yeah. Like you see it on YouTube, the and the great thing is like he's totally seventies out with like the flared pants and, and yeah. the hair going back and everything. But uh, it's he's like running around barbecues and stuff mm -hmm. like that. It's amazing. Yeah. So. Yeah. Dave, um, I'm here to ask the dumb questions because I know yes. a lot less about, <laughs> about <laughs> how to actually operate what you're operating. <laughs> and yeah. my first dumb question is uh, something you said was you said, you know, and if you know what you're doing, you do X, <laughs> Y and Z. So yeah. uh, as someone like me who does not know exactly what goes into actually operating the Steadicam, what are you really controlling other than holding this piece of equipment on your body as you're moving? What are the kind of things that you are keeping an eye on? Um, well, I mean, you're, you're basically doing the exact same job as any operator. So you're framing the story. And I mean, at the end of the day, look, operating is 100% about story and everything should, uh, you know, story leads everything. If it actually becomes a rep about the shot, I personally, I, I, I think you, you have not done your job well. And there have been times where I've sort of looked at people and gone, I think this is becoming about the shot. And I don't think it mm -hmm. should be about the shot. And we try mm. to pull back or I try to pull it back. But um, so, you know, I mean, telling the story, framing, headroom, et cetera, et cetera, the same things that you're doing as an operator. But then you're also making a lot of times you're walking backwards. So you have a spotter mm -hmm. on you. Um, you have, depending on the camera, anywhere from like maybe 40 to 65 pounds on you. And it's like wearing a backpack, but the thing is, because of how the arm is and where the weight is, your center of gravity goes from being in the center of your body to slightly forward of your body. So you're actually leaning backwards. I mean, to, to, to quote unquote master it, which to me means you could go onto a set and not worry that you're going to totally screw up is, <laughs> is, is probably anywhere from like 
two to five years, I would think. <laughs> um, and and when I bought my first Steadicam, uh, I actually ran around my apartment building. I was actually delivering prosthetic hips to hospitals in California, which is as amazing as wow. it sounds. Um, that is a Hollywood <laughs> job. If I've yeah, it was like, one. I was like, if I'm going to go, I'm going to go big. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, I was doing that during the day. And at night, I would literally run around my apartment building, like scaring people as they open their doors with this thing to try to figure out how to do it. And then actually, there used to be a company, there used to be a company called FM Rocks that would do like, six rap videos in a weekend. And um, I actually used to work there with, uh, and the cinematographer I worked with was Matty Libatique. Who's oh my God. Oh, wow. Yeah. He's yeah. Shockingly. But but mm-hmm. what, if I could show you some of the things that we did. <laughs> <laughs> but the I'm great sh- thing was like, we got paid nothing, but they didn't care because they were like, hey, move that thing. And so you learned how to use it because right. you could mess up and it didn't make a difference. Um, but there's a tremendous amount of balance. I mean, to give you an idea, like, it's sort of like doing Tai Chi with like cement bags tied to you <laughs> because you have to be extremely elegant with it and you and, and it's very finesse. And um, one of the things that you have to mess with, although now they're electronic stabilizers, but I won't get into that, is the horizon because if you don't mm-hmm. do it perf- if you don't do it really well, it'll sort of like rock like a boat as you're going. And uh. if you if you know what you're looking for, you can tell bad steady cam very, very you easily. can. And that's yeah. why it's on a on a pan. That's I, if it's on a really good steady cam operator, that horizon line is so dead even yeah. when you when yeah. you're panning. And then I feel like there's that slight tilt into the yep. pan, and that's instantly when you can tell. And there have been some movies we've I've watched recently where I'm like, oh my god, that yeah. pan was per like so clean, so cleanly executed. Uh, it's just yeah. And and Dave, you set it up now for us to dive into our next question perfectly, sure. which is. Aside from needing to get away from the artificial hip industry, um, <laughs> what brought Who says you? I did? <laughs> right, exactly. He's still <laughs> slinging them from the back of his car. Yeah, exactly. Um, what drew you? You know, obviously to film in in general, uh, because as you said, Steadicam operators are storytellers, and that's something that we're trying to get across throughout this entire series. 100%. Everybody that works on a film set. Yeah is a storyteller. They are all engaging very specific disciplines in order to help tell a story. But what brought you to camera operating and city cam operating in particular? Um, Because it's obviously something that you have such a talent for, um, but it's also so specific. So I'm curious how you reached it. So uh, when I was seven, I saw Star Wars and I wanted to be a Jedi Knight. And then right. at some point, my <laughs> entire world was dashed and I realized that wasn't a thing. And then I thought, I want to be the people who like made the Jedi Knight or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so I just wanted to be in film. And I, knew, I I grew up in Connecticut. It's like, you know, burgeoning film community there. And um, I had zero idea. And I was like, I guess you go to college for it. And so I went to NYU, and uh, which uh, had its ups and downs. Uh, and, um, and then my sophomore year, uh, before the summer, two friends from Connecticut and I were like, let's get a car and go to California. And we were like, okay, because we were stupid and we had nothing to do. And, (laughs) and we drove out there and we got here and I don't know really what I was thinking. I was, I mean, I don't think, I I didn't really think I'd go and be like, Hey, everybody's going to be like, Dave's here, you know? (laughs) He Um, made it. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But I, yeah, I, I I didn't think it through. A lot of my career has been not thinking things through actually. Um, But, uh, and I got out here and we didn't have a place to stay. So we stayed on the floor of uh we sat on the floor of my buddy's mother's college roommate who happened to be a sure. producer for this co- yeah of course as <laughs> as it happens um mm-hmm. who happened to be a producer for this company called forward uh productions that mm-hmm. um among other things they did the worm in the the water worm in the abyss oh wow and, uh terminator 2 which i ended up working with them and she called him up and she's like i got the kid here you gotta hire him and they were you like, gotta yeah, get him we'll, off my floor we'll, right exactly <laughs> yeah we'll, we'll pay you you know i don't know 50 bucks a day or whatever and you'll mm-hmm. be a production assistant and a production assistant for forward productions was basically like <laughs> one day the cameraman was teaching me how to thread the camera and another day i was like putting up girders on the ceiling and another way they were teaching me how to how to weld and I mean whatever wow. and I was working on this movie called Tremors and I was just like this is interesting mm-hmm. and I went I went back to to school and just realized I'm paying a lot of money to basically yep. learn not, I don't know what I'm doing and and I have to say uh, my parents are very educated very professional people my dad's a pediatric cardiologist and I went to another one and I said I'm dropping out of school and I'm going into the film industry and they were yeah. like 
okay. <laughs> <laughs> and they yeah. uh, they actually supported me in it, and they did not understand any of it. And and to this day, by the way, <laughs> yeah, they're still uh, like, "How's that career going?" <laughs> to, to this day, my dad will be like, he'll call me up and be like, "You're working? No, yeah. do some freelance. You got any work coming up? Nothing right now." I'm like, so like it got to the point where I'd be lying. I'd be like, yes, I have to go to work. Yeah. Uh, because he can't handle the ca- the fact that I don't always know where my next job is coming from. But um, but anyway, they really supported me. So I, I came out here and worked for Forward again because uh, they said, if you ever come back. And I did this movie called Clifford with Martin Short that uh, mm-hmm. nobody ever heard of. And then uh, and then Terminator 2, we did the the um, nuclear blowing L.A. up. Uh, Amazing. And then I was kind of like, I want to be, I, I want to be in the camera world and not breathe in toxic fumes all the time. So I, I left there and got into camera assisting and then saw a steady cam and it just blew my mind. And I literally was like, I have to do this. How do I do this? It was one of those weird things in your life that doesn't happen to most people where you go, that's what I'm going to do. Mm. And then somehow I was able to do it. So, um, yeah, it's been a, and I, I also have to say my dad is an amateur, but very good photographer. And I spent mm-hmm. a lot of my childhood, like in the dark room developing and watching stuff develop. And I think, I think there's an innate sense of, of yeah. storytelling there. Well, you know? and just get the knowledge of how to frame an yeah. image and, and as, as much as, you know, obviously the director and the cinematographer are going to weigh in, but at the end of the day, getting to our next question once the director and cinematographer step away, it's just you and the actors. It's yeah. this really intimate dance when you get it's, to watch it. It's really cool. It's um, the best. Yeah. Sometimes the actor leads. Sometimes you can tell the operator's leading and the actor's using them for positioning. Um, can you can you describe that relationship? Because very few people on set get to have such an intimate relationship with the actors. And There's, could you describe yeah. that relationship and... And how you improvise, you know, off of them and they off of you in order to get the shot that you need to tell the story. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I mean, there's, there's a lot to that question. Um, you do it work. You know, you're, the weird one of the weird things about the film industry is like you're working with millionaires <laughs> and these people who are massive stars and whatever. And so. Early on, I just decided, you know what, they're just people like everyone else. And some of them are, you know, some of them are schmoes and some of them are cool and whatever. And so over the years, I've just sort of treated everybody like everybody else and that they were no more important, even though I will say an actor is in front of the camera and they're bearing themselves. And I think that they have potentially a harder job than most other people on set for that. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, one of the things that I was taught early on or I, I, I learned early on um, was that part of my job is obviously my job is to frame and to tell the story and this and that and the other. But the other part of that is to, and I don't know how to say this without sounding all woke, but um, <laughs> because I'm not, I'm not intending to sound woke, but to create like a safe space for them where it's like, cause I've been in situations where people are like, I mean, doing really, really emotional work. Mm-hmm. And I've had people look at me and go, I'm going to use you. Okay. And I'm like, I'm here for you. And I'll mm-hmm. literally like back when I used to have, or when you're doing handheld, but back, you know, back when we used to have our hand, our, our eye in the eyepiece all the time, which I don't anymore, which drives me nuts because the video ruins your eyes. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, there were times where I would keep my other eye open so I could make eye contact with them. Um, and look, the reality is there are some actors who literally are like, I don't like you here. <laughs> mm-hmm. You're like, oh, this is going to be a fun couple of months. Um, and then there are some actors who I've become really good friends with. And, yeah. and it's literally just because I'm like, yeah, you're an actor and you're this and that and the other. But I'm also this. I'll, t- I'll tell you, by the way, Jamie Lee Curtis, who just won an Academy mm-hmm. Award last night, mm-hmm. I could not be happier for her because she's the most wonderful person in the entire world. Like everything you want Jamie Lee Curtis to be, she is. Oh, good. <laughs> she's so great. And and I worked with her on Scream Queens 2 or something like that. Mm-hmm. But she was like the first person on set and the last person and just the most professional. Um, so you run into people like that who just like, you know, for every every person who I won't say who you've worked with here, like, wow, I don't know that I'd completely stop my car if you were crossing the street. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's terrible. That would never happen because um, I'd get my name in the paper. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, then you meet people like that and you're like, this is great. But, um, you know, uh, did that answer your question? I'm not sure if I answered yeah. your question. No, and no. Oh, the, you, were, you were asking, sorry, you were asking also about, about sort of the dance and whatever, which with Steadicam, there is a lot of it. Mm-hmm. And I think it's like everything else. Like you can, you know. You can be dancing with a dancing partner and stepping all over their feet, and then you can dance with someone else and just everything falls into place. And there are some times where it just all works. And I personally, 
if the director and the director of photography are hip to it and will allow me to it do it um i'll improvise a lot when i'm when i'm filming because there'll just mm-hmm. be moments where they're the, the 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 best thing in the world you mentioned that you know you're in there and the camera's rolling it's like you know sets are as you know sets are chaos they're com- mm-hmm. they, it's, it's like completely mildly controlled to chaos most likely not controlled chaos and there's tons of noise and everybody's doing this and that and the other and whatever and then the cameras roll and it's just everything gets really quiet and then it's like okay now it's my turn and it's their turn and it's the assistant's turn and and the my dolly grip's turn and and it's just this unbelievable magical time and that that to me it's like it's like i mean it's a drug there's no question about it but on that note you're talking to me as a camera operator but i'm i'm nothing without my assistant and my dolly grip and also by the way this the you know our our, our sound guy i mean mm-hmm. you know there's so many people who have to do that dance i just did the last season of snowfall and um we had a great assistant on that and Dolly Grip I've worked with before. And within a week, we were all so in sync with each other that like something would happen and my assistant would just know that he was going to go to it when focus. And I would know that we were going to like frame differently and the Dolly Grip would do. And it just becomes like jazz. I mean, and the thing about it, that that's the best thing in the world for me is you could never plan that stuff. Like those mm-hmm. are those magical moments where you catch something and everybody behind the monitor is just like, oh my God. And you're like, yeah, right. <laughs> then of course they go, let's do it again. And you're like, yeah, exactly. Happen? <laughs> Before Lizzie pops in with a quick question, I wanted to clarify something, which is that as you're operating the camera, there is another person on set who is pulling focus for yes. you. And, yes. and pulling focus means they are changing the focus distance of the lens in order to keep specific actors or objects in focus. And that's in two objects moving relative to one another that a third person had then has to control the relative distance between them. So, and then you, of course, as you mentioned, you have your dolly grip, maybe spotting, and then you've got your sound boom operator moving yep. in tandem behind you. There are a lot of people involved in this dance. So this is actually, that's actually what I wanted to ask because you said like sometimes I'll improvise when the director, you know, will allow me. And Mm -hmm. as you're rattling off the people that are kind of surrounding you, (laughs) I'm envisioning you like some sort of like tentacled octopus. And it's, I, how do you, how are you able to improvise in that environment when you have that many people that are kind of coming with you and how do you work with them? Well, it doesn't, it doesn't always work. And you have to know who your people are to know if you can do that. But there are literally times with a really good boom operator, like Ozark was like this. I had a boom operator we're working with this Jared, who's this great guy. And, and, you know, if something was going to change, I would just throw him a look and he would go, okay, mm-hmm. something's happening. And, and cause you know, I, I'm not, I don't have my, my eye up to the camera when I'm doing steady cam, my, my head's, you know, so I'll just throw him a nod and he'll know that something's happening. And then I'll, you know, usually it's usually not a whip pan or something like that. Right. But, but even even that, you know, things like that can work. But what you end up doing is you end up, hopefully, if, if you're doing it well and you're doing it right, recognizing what you can get away with and what you can't. I mean, obviously, because of lighting and because of this and that, and you have to keep in mind, like the director of photography, you don't want to you don't want to do something that's going to jeopardize what they've done. Um, I, I think the other the other thing I'll say, actually, is. A lot of assistants and dolly grips uh, that I work with that I haven't worked with before, within a week or two, will go, oh, <laughs> <laughs> I see what's going on. Like, I have to be paying attention at every possible moment because mm-hmm, this could change. Right. But also, I will I, I will also try to be very wary of understanding that if I do a sudden lurch in and the assistant doesn't know about it, they're just never – I mean, there's no way they're going to do it. So I don't want to throw them under the bus, you know? Right. Um, and then a lot of times what will happen is – you know, we'll do take three and take four and take five and, and I'll I'll put the steady cam down <clears throat> or even on the dolly and I'll go up to the assistant assistant, I'll go, look, I have a feeling uh, I'm making something up here. I have a feeling that he's gonna step forward on this line because he seems to be doing it every time. And when he does it, I want to crush in on him. So just be ready for that. And they're like, okay, so you give him a heads up, you know. Mm. And and then the other part of it to me, which is the beauty of all of this, is if you're not prepared to fail, you're never going to do the, you're never going to get the good stuff. You know what I mean? It's like, it's, it's like acting. It's like, you know, the great performances are always on that line of just being absolutely horrible, but they don't <laughs> quite go there. You know, it's like, so I always, I always say to the assistants I work with in the Dolly group, you know, I'd rather you go for it and we screw up and I'll take the bullet than we don't ever try anything, do you know? Yeah. Um, but it of course depends on who you're working for. Yeah. 
sounds like it just requires a lot of trust of all the of you and all the people around you and yeah and sometimes it's not there and sometimes it doesn't work but to me that's where that's you know that's sort of where where the good stuff is totally you also you mentioned that your rig weighs you said what like 40 45 pounds it depends on the camera and other things yeah yeah How, what is that i mean as someone who just sits glued to a computer with no weight on them all day, I can't imagine what that does to your body. Oh, it's <laughs> what, what is the sort of like, what's the actual physical toll of doing your job? I mean, that weighs crazy. I hold my cat sometimes. He weighs like 12 pounds. <laughs> well, I don't know how big your cat is. Maybe your cat. Um, but uh, uh, well, the physical toll on me has actually been significant because I was, I've been doing this for 33 years or 32 years or something like that. Wow. And now I look at the steady cam and I'm like, oh, that's painful. But mm-hmm. um uh, but I, the reason I say that is because when I got into it, things were not at people like ergonomic wasn't a word. <laughs> people are like, here, put this on and, and mm-hmm. run around with it. And it's just like, should it hurt? Yeah, it should hurt because it makes you strong. <laughs> Eat your Wheaties. Um, so, uh, yeah, I've, 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 I've got a herniated disc that I've worked mm-hmm. through and, uh, my shoulder has been screwed up and this and that and the other. So th- this business takes its toll on you. Um, and and there are times I know for a fact that I show up on set and people are like, "That's the study cam operator," <laughs> and then, you know. And then they'll do this like you know this like we're going to do this huge huge study cam shot down three things, and I'm like, or. We mm-hmm. could put a wide angle in the corner and just let the whole thing play because yeah. that would be organic. So you get really good at like talking people out of shots. Sure. Organic is a really good word to use mm-hmm. that directors mm-hmm. like. Uh, <laughs> I might need to use that at my job. <laughs> yeah, but um, but no, I, I will say uh, when I was younger, um, the big thing was recovery. I, I have I have a it takes me a lot longer to recover from a big day than it used to be, but. I still get through it. And uh, I mean, I, I I do a lot more stretching than I used to, that's for sure. But it does take its toll. There's no question. I, I'll also say that like uh, when I get massages from like someone I haven't before, they usually get to my lower back and there's kind of like a poke and then they mm-hmm. stop and then they're sort of like, what exactly do you do for a living? Because <laughs> yeah. I have sort of muscle groups there that most people don't have. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, I have a question that I think Lizzie follows up well on that one, which is... Um, We've obviously transitioned to digital capture for <laughs> most uh, projects at this point. Uh, film is expensive, hard drives, uh, the, actually economics are debatable when you really go into them. But, oh, completely um, debatable. Yeah. Mm. I have a question. Yeah, and and so in terms of the cost that might be borne by your crew, uh, digital allows a lot of takes. And yep. it allows a lot of takes when maybe you should take more time to figure out a better way to do the shot, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't want to speak for you, Dave, but I'm curious if you have felt that that getting more takes is is overall an advantage you know, for you, or is this just going to enable potentially bad, like sort of a let's just keep beating the dead horse behavior yeah. when it comes to capturing shots. I, I totally think, I, I think digital digital has largely, has destroyed a large part of this industry. Um, I hate to be that blunt, but the thing is, it used to be that you rehearsed because you had to get it right because you were expending something. Like there was like, exactly. you know, I mean, you can always get more film, but it's like, we only have 2000 feet of film for the day or, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. And um, so you rehearsed it and and you did it right. And now the thing is like, let's shoot the rehearsal. Maybe magic will happen. And our thing <laughs> that's is always favorite. like- That's always uh, my favorite term though. Maybe geez. magic will happen. Well, and like, the, thing, the thing that <laughs> I always want- We've not even tried it. <laughs> I know. But the thing that I always want to go is like, first of all, magic doesn't happen. We're good at our jobs. That's what yeah, we're exactly. talking about. So let's call it what it is. But secondly, th- then you'll shoot the rehearsal and they'll be like, well, that didn't work. And it's like, yeah, that's because we never rehearsed it. You know, and it's just like- and the other thing is that's weird is, um, you know, the Steadicam has like a post going through it with the camera on top. And it when we went to digital, it took me a little bit to get this through my head because what I realized was when I could feel the film vibrating through the through the rig, mm. I knew it was go time. Like I knew something was happening. Mm-hmm. And, and it used to be that when we rolled film, like something... It's a, I don't want to put too big a thing on it, but like sort of something something big was happening, you know, mm-hmm. something was happening, and now it's like, eh, whatever, we'll we'll cut and we'll go again. But um, you know, it drives me nuts. I I, I often 
you know, ask them to cut just for the sake of the editors. Cause, and yeah. also by the way, something else people don't think about is like we shoot two hours of uh, two hours of digital. Our loader has to sit in the truck and download for two hours, you know? Mm-hmm. So if, if we finish at the end of the night and there's an hour and a half of stuff to be downloaded, well, they got another hour and a half to go. And processing and it, those dailies is oh. ex- still expensive, very yeah. expensive and getting them uploaded for the studio. Oh, yeah. And yeah. there are all sorts of costs that people don't, Think about well, and by brain. the way, I don't want to go into a whole tangent, but one thing I'll mention is that people don't think about all of this digital stuff has to sit on some sort of medium, like a hard yep. drive, and that right. hard drive has to be replaced every couple of years, and it has yep. to be run all the day. It's like it's like a whole thing, anyway. Yeah, we'll yeah. get into uh, the environmental impacts at the end, Dave, because I, <laughs> I I did look into your background on that front okay. as well. Not a, not a big fan of digital. I mean, look, there are certain aspects of it that that really it makes it more accessible to people, and there there are good parts to it, but um, overall, the times when I get to shoot film still is just like ah, oh, this is fantastic, you know. What's the last uh, project you shot on film? The last project I shot on film was was Widows with Steve McQueen. Oh, oh wow. wow. Yeah. yeah, that movie looked great. Yeah, um, it was beautiful. It, it was Steve McQueen and Sean Bobbitt are like, uh, they're, they're, they're the yeah. dream team. They're unbelievable. And you did uh, Shame with them <laughs> I did Shame. as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's great. That's, that's where I met them. Actually, they had like no money. And I had, a, I had an agent at the time and he called me up and he goes, these people like want to they want you to come out and da da And I was just like, yes. And he goes, mm-hmm. what? And I said, do you have any idea who Steve McQueen is? Because he'd only done Hunger. And he goes, yeah, no. Yeah. And I was like, okay, first of all, we're going to have to talk. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. I, I, I remember saying to him, I said, listen, I want to do this because I am never going to work with Martin Scorsese when he does Mean Streets, but I will work with Steve McQueen when he does his, his next mm-hmm. movie. And and it was, it was everything. It, he was phenomenal. What do you um, what do you look for in a director? Like when you is it just cuz that you love their work or was it was it something about him in particular that you were like I have to I work with him? I didn't know anything about him. I just seen Hunger. I don't have you ever seen Hunger? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, uh, I mean uh, uh, Hunger the thing about Hunger to me is um it's a movie that nobody else could make. Mm-hmm. And someone else could make it, but it wouldn't be that movie. It has an it has it has a it has a vision and it has an imprint on it, and it's a, it's his movie. And I just thought I thought it was a brilliant way to tell that story on every level. And so I was just so excited to work with someone like that because the reality is you work with really really mediocre people a lot, and you work with a lot of crappy people. I'm not only talking about directors, I'm talking about across the board. Sure. Um, and occasionally you get to work with someone who's just stupendous at what they do. And to me, that's the most incredible time. And, and uh, you know, um, it, it's just like, that's, that's what I got into this for it, you know? And he's just, he's just an incredible storyteller. He, he's amazing. Um, and Sean Bobbitt, his cinematographer is, is, is as well. The two of them together, a dream team. Something that I've often noticed on set, um, and I'm sure you have, when a shot is not properly prepared uh, Mm -hmm. or you're running behind on time, there can be a temptation to throw the camera on Steadicam and let's put it on Steadicam and just kind of wing it. Can you walk us through, you've talked about rehearsal and kind of, I think, what it takes to do a prepared Shot. Can you tell me, talk to me about the pain of having to do an unprepared shot as a storyteller on set and kind of help the audience understand like the cost of an unfocused shot as it reverberates through, you know, the starting with you all the way down to the edit, you know what I'm saying, in terms of how it works? Yeah. And also, like, are there shots where you felt uncomfortable or been asked to do something where you felt unsafe or uncomfortable? unsafe there definitely have i mean everybody has um it's just the way that it is uh hopefully people listen to you that but but uh, yeah to your question it's just like there's this thing of like i don't know we're not quite sure what it is but let's just put the steady cam on and sort of find it let's find mm-hmm. it and it's just mm-hmm. always like first of all who is we <laughs> 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 who's the let's in this because it seems like only one of us is going to hold the steady cam um <laughs> it's it's look. There's a certain part of that that's that drives me nuts because it's like I, <laughs> I don't know what you did during prep, but your job was to figure out what this was. Um, and nine times out of ten, it's because they don't know. And and unfortunately, one of the things that happens both with handheld and with Steadicam is sort of like, well, and nobody will say this, but it's like the scene really isn't working, so let's just give it some movement. Mm-hmm. And it's just like that's not the answer. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, by that point, you know, you you're not rewriting or whatever. Um, so then what you end up doing as a Steadicam operator, and I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about a situation maybe where the director is not as involved in sort of going, hey, you go in there and figure it out and then I'll look good. And, um, you know, so 
There is, I will say, a sort of that can be kind of fun. To be perfectly honest, um, hmm. I recently did a show with a scene with seven actors, and it was clear that the director did not have a job, and the AD was uh, have a have an idea. And he didn't AD have a job was, after that. He, yeah. well, no, of course, not that's not the way the business works, unfortunately, because someone did a good job, and he's going to put it on his reel. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, but then what you do is you go. Okay, so let's sort of like just okay, let's let's have the actors walk through it and see where we're going and see kind of what 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 falls in and then you sort of find some sort of a master, but then as you're going, you're literally in your head going, okay, we're going to have to come back and we're going to get that piece, we're going to have to get that piece, and we're going to have to get this piece, and then this piece can connect to that piece. So there is sort of a fun aspect to that, but the thing that drives me nuts is 9 times out of 10 at the end of the day, what you end up with was, yeah, the scene works. And it's just like we're not in. I, I mean, I'm not in the business to go. This it works. I'm yeah. in the business mm-hmm. to go. You had a great idea because my 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 thing is always there's so much that that goes on before I ever get you know handed the camera that I can't control. Right? right. So I can't control the writing. I can't control the casting. I can't control so many things. So my thing is always the way the way I view my job or the way I view an operator's job is. My job is to take what they've given me and make it better, right? Mm-hmm. It is to is to is to push the push the you know push the boulder up the hill a little bit, and if I've done that, then then I think I've I've done my job. But but if the boulder's at the bottom of the hill when they give it to me, I'm like, <laughs> wait a minute, um, yeah, sure, I improved it, but it doesn't make it good, do you know. Um, so that, that can be very frustrating. Like I said, it also is sort of liberating because you're like, oh, nobody really has an opinion. So I'll, let's, let's do this, you know? And there are times where we've come up with something really good, but that said, and I, I, I mentor a lot of younger operators and I always tell them this, that is where understanding the story and the script, like to the nth degree comes in because you totally know why the characters are doing what they're doing and where it's going. And, oh, this person has to have that moment and this and that and the other, um, which you shouldn't because it's not your job. It's someone else's job. But sometimes you have to be there. And there are sometimes yeah. where we'll be in there and be like, hey, don't we need this moment here? Why? Well, because like four scenes from now, like she's going to have this thing going. Oh, yeah, we have to get that. That's Yeah, absolutely. And you're like, why am I coming up with this? Mm-hmm. But, you know, that's the way I look at it. So it's like, you know, you read the script over and over and over, just so you know it like the back of your hand, hopefully. You know, it's interesting what you just said about like you needing to also know because you're going to be able to sort of pick things up. It reminded me a little bit of, we also uh, recently interviewed an intimacy coordinator and she yeah. she said something sort of similar where she was like talking to Michaela Cole and Michaela Cole is like walking her through a whole scene and and the Ida, the uh, intimacy coordinator was like, well, none of this is on the page. Yeah. And it's, it's, there's something so interesting about the filmmaking process that like so much prep and groundwork really has to happen. And everybody has to be part of that information resource because everyone is part of the story that has to be told. And a hundred percent. Yeah. It's so cool to hear you talk about this. It's really easy to think like the script is for the actors to know their lines. Yeah. Not, the script is the blueprint for every single person mm-hmm. on set to understand where they are in the story and how that part of the story is going to be told it's at any particular right. moment. Yeah, it's, no, it's, it's, it's absolutely right. I mean, and I'll go and highlight stuff for moments mm-hmm. that we can make sure we get. And, you know, the reality is I'm, the hope is that someone's going to tell me all that, right? Because someone sure. else should have the idea. And I may be wrong. I mean, at the end of the day, there are a lot of times where I'm like, all right, I'm going to do that. I think you're totally wrong, but I'm going to do that because that's <laughs> my job. Um, and, and I've been wrong, you know, because I just haven't, I'm not seeing it the way that they're seeing it. But at the end of the day, it's the director's vision that you're trying to get out there, right? It's not your vision because that's not who you are. And I've actually directed before, so I've been mm-hmm. on that side of it too. So it's like a whole, that's a whole different thing. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, you know, so uh, it's, by the way, I love the intimacy coordinator uh, interview. It was great. Um, There's our nice. plug. Go listen to it, guys. <laughs> yes, you uh, all should listen to it. It's really great because it's this fascinating job that yeah. I don't think people understand. And I was I was saying to Chris before you came on, that one of the things that kind of amazes me with the really good ones is they'll check in with me and they'll be like, mm. Hey, how are you doing? And I'm like, really? So <laughs> oh, I'm doing all right. Um, Cause you know, it's, it's a weird thing to be involved. In. Yeah. Um, you're, you're mm. in there too. You're probably oh, yeah. closer than <laughs> yeah, exactly. a lot of other oh, people. <laughs> oh yeah. There's no question about it. So, um, 
Yeah. Let's hop to the next question. Okay. We'll give you a moment to think. My question yes. is, which shot are you most proud of in your entire career? But while you think about that for one second, I have a Donnie Darko, Darko question. <laughs> I uh, thought you were just going to go straight to Donnie Darko. Uh, yeah. So why, is gonna... <laughs> is it the, the, why is it this shot in Donnie Darko that I've got? Yes, up? yes. Uh, early in the film, uh, his first on-screen sleepwalking incident he yep. you go down the stairs and then there is a push towards the door where you tilt up to the chandelier, to the chandelier. and, then, yeah. and then you come down as the door is closing and we never actually see him enter yes. or leave frame and it's one of my that's one of my favorite shots oh really hey you know ever. what Props Did to you, because that's the shot nobody ever brings up. I kind of forgot about that shot. I do like and that I, shot. <laughs> I thought, I initially, I was like, oh, maybe that's a dolly shot. But then I, but the more I thought about it, no, that was probably a steady cam shot. I think it's a steady cam shot because I, because I had to bring him down and sort of like, and dance yeah. around with him and go up as he went yes. down. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I, Those. that anyway, I just wanted to say that is my nerding out. <laughs> that's my favorite shot. That's actually one of my favorite shots ever, but it's certainly my favorite wow. shot in that movie. Um and in terms of telling the story, here's why I love that shot. Mm -hmm. We guide you guide him out of the house, but no one sees him leave, and you don't let us see him leave yeah. either. And you plant the chandelier, which is going to come in when the airplane yep. hits in the exactly. following scene. And it's it's great. It's a brilliant example of everything you're talking about, where it's like the camera is operating in perfect harmony with both the story and the lead actor and character. And it tells you everything you need to know. But again, it's not showy. It's not, yeah. you know what I mean? Like I noticed it because I've watched that movie so many times. Sure, but, sure, sure, sure. Um, anywho, so great example. Well, that's uh, great. Thank you. I will Darko. tell you without even knowing, that's 100% Richard Kelly. Richard Kelly knew every inch of that movie mm. and did yeah. not listen to anybody because he knew it so well and he was right. <laughs> yeah, um, no, clearly 100%. he was yeah. 100% no, it, right. It was kind of astonishing. Uh, but um, but but I will say you said something that that you weren't sure if it was a dolly shot, you weren't sure if it was a Steadicam shot. So to me, that means that it it worked because the yeah. thing is, you should never think about. I mean, you're you're a couple, you know, a couple uh, uh, showings in, but um, you should never think about it. The guy who who trained me in Steadicam, Bob Crone was his name. He sat us down and he talked to us about the business of Steadicam or whatever, and he said the irony of what we do is that if we've done it well, nobody will ever know we did it. And, right. and and I always thought that was great. It's like, mm -hmm. because if they're watching your shot, then they're not watching the, the, the movie. Um, so that's, that's cool. Thank you. Um, uh, you know, favorite shots are there. So it, it's, it's sort of hard to pull out, but the one that I kind of am really proud of is there's a shot in shame that is in the subway and follows mm -hmm. him up the stairs and then comes around very slowly. And the thing that I like about it is it's, the freneticism of he's looking for this woman and he can't find her and he's sort of dodging people and whatever. And yeah. we did, we did. And that was the first shot I ever did with Sean and Steve actually. And, um, and those stairs were pretty hard. Uh, but, um, we did like one or two takes and Sean came over to me and he was like, it doesn't have the feeling that I want. And I said, you know what? I think I know what it is. And I pulled the AD over and I said, do you mind if I talk to the extras? He said, yeah. And I, I called him over. I said, Hey, I'm Dave. I'm the steady cam operator. I'm going, you know what I'm doing now, right? I said, don't get out of my way. And they were like, huh? I said, don't get out of my way. Make me go around you. I mean, don't hit me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, don't purposely. But but if I'm coming at you, make me go. And and they were and I said, here's the thing. He has to dodge you. Mm -hmm. So I have to dodge you. And it does they don't do as much as I would have liked, but they do enough that I'm trying to keep yeah. up with him. And then when it gets up to the top and he realizes that she's gone, it totally, uh, it totally um smooths out and it's a really complicated shot to do and the thing to me is the re reason besides besides the technical aspects of it are just i think it's a great way to tell that story and i will say the person who deserves the most props for that shot is ludovic liddy who is now a great dp but was the focus puller that was on film and at the very top of the thing i come around and i'm like oh it's going great and it's going great and we come into michael fassbender's thing and at the last minute he just leans back and i went Ah, oh, because mm -hmm. it was like we didn't it, it was just it was so imperceptible, but I knew exactly what it was. 
And I and they and we watch him go down the stairs and we cut and I turned to Ludo and I said Ludo and he goes I got it and I was like yeah. uh, <laughs> the best. and that and that was filmed so there was no mm-hmm. you know there's no playback or whatever but he knew exactly what I was worried about but he was on it and if he hadn't been that shot wouldn't have been usable so that's um, so cool they're yeah, just I, like that shot there are so many nuances in that mm-hmm. shot that I love so um, well and yeah. as soon as because I know what shot you're talking I mean it's it's an incredible it's such a like an anxiety inducing uh, yeah. segment and hearing you talk about that is just so, so cool. Cause like that, that shot just wouldn't, it wouldn't make me feel the way that it does if you hadn't, you hadn't oh, that's done great. that. That means we did our job. I mean, yeah. you know, but it, but it's a full team, right? It's like the ADs and it's Michael and, and it's me and it's the cinematographer. It's, it's like all that. And the, and the main thing to me is like, yeah, you have this really hard part of the job, but everybody has hard stuff. And it's just like, you don't want to drop the ball. Like right. you're like, <laughs> let someone else drop the ball if it doesn't work, but I don't want to be the one to drop the ball. Um, There's also um the famous one that everybody sort of talks about is there's an, a shot in West Wing called five uh, and an episode called five votes down. It's episode three or four. And it's this massive shot in the Biltmore Hotel. And uh, I just think of it because I mean I'm very proud of it, but um, it, it was like two flights of stairs, and mm, I mean, wow. it was it was insanely big, um, to the point that uh, I was the operator in West Wing, and they go, "Hey, we got this idea for a shot, but we're not sure it's doable." And they kept me on the clock after we wrapped to drive down to the Biltmore to walk through it, and they were like, "Can you do this?" And I, I was. I don't know, 29 or whatever. And I was mm-hmm. like, yeah, sure. And the next day I'm thinking to myself, like, what the hell? Did yeah. I do here? But, um, yeah. but, but we, and I think we did 16 takes of it. And the one Ugh. that's in there, I think is take 11. And I remember very specifically that I think it, it was either take nine or take seven, where just, it's one of those things where everything worked, like mm-hmm. everything worked. And you, sometimes you just know, like you're doing it, you're like, this is it. And, and, and then of course they say they want another one and you're like, I'm going to kill everybody here. <laughs> but, um, but everything was working. And we got to the very end where there's really nothing left to do, but just walk backwards and finish up. And I kick the steady cam with my knee. Oh, and it went no. up in the air and I literally, I, I, li- I was like, oh my, and, and I remember Martin Sheen goes, oh man. <laughs> and I was, and I just, I just, it was absolutely horrible. And I'll tell you something. <laughs> I don't tell a lot of people this. I went over into a corner and I literally thought I was going to cry. I was so upset with myself. And I was just like, cause you never want to drop the ball. Right. Yeah. And everything was going so well. <laughs> I had forgotten about this. Um, I mean, I remember about it, but I can't believe I'm telling you this. Uh, and um, and and I'm standing there, and I I feel a hand on my shoulder, and I realize that Brad Whitford, who's the funniest person <laughs> yes. in the world, and and still a good friend of mine, and he he comes up to me, and he comes very, very like 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 unnaturally close to my ear, and he quietly goes. You're a huge disappointment. (laughs) (laughs) He just walked away, and uh, and and I remember thinking like, yeah, okay, and you know, then walked Uh. upstairs, and and actually, I walked upstairs, and by the time I got there, uh, Martin came and and like patted me on the back and sort of grabbed my grabbed my neck and squeezed me, and and it was his way of going like, you know, I'm sorry, I didn't mean, you know. They were it's great. great. People, but yeah, yeah, I feel like having Bradley Whitford call you a huge disappointment would be an Incredible. amazing bucket list item Brad, that we all should Brad, go for. Brad Whitford on West Wing. We, I, I just ran into him in a plane actually, like two weeks ago. We were talking about this. There was one shot on West Wing. <laughs> I don't remember why he had a he had a, a what do you call it? He had a a scarf in the scene. And they said, all right, we're up. And and I had my study cam, you know, my arm on, and I was about to put the rig on. And he flipped his his scarf back and turned to me and said, uh, pick up your tools of ignorance, camera boy, and follow me to greatness, <laughs> and then walked out the room. And I, I, to this day, it's like one of the funniest so things good. anyone's ever said to me. He's he's wow. as funny as you would think he is. He's, oh, he's so funny. Yeah, he, yeah. And it, we could talk about Brad Woodford. No, I know. Actually, Ad right, Nazi, I'll tell you yeah. one other thing. is like I got on the plane, and of course, he's in first class, and I saw yeah. him, and he saw me, and he starts pushing the, the thing. So <laughs> I go back, and I sit in steerage, and I texted him, and he texts me back, and he says, I don't understand why are, why are, um <laughs> why are uh, texts from the common people reaching first class? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's great. Anyway. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, Dave, thank you so much. This has been an absolute pleasure. Uh, so much of a pleasure that we're actually, we're going to talk to Dave uh, on another episode as well. So you're not rid of him yet. <laughs> um, and uh, Chris, I, I know you wanted to share a little bit before we sign off as well. Yeah. Dave, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. 
It has been a true pleasure. And for all of our listeners out there, you can learn more about Dave. Obviously, you can IMDb him. You can watch his work. Or you can also go to his website. That's Dave Kamides, D-A-V-E-C-H-A-M-E-I-D-E-S, DaveKamides.com. There you can see his reel and his work. And there are also opportunities through the Learn icon at the top of the webpage for young filmmakers and operators and those of you who might be interested in filmmaking and operating to learn more about film from somebody who has been on more sets than any of us will hope to be on uh, for the rest of our lives. So Dave, thank you again for giving us this time, your incredible experience and your stories. We deeply appreciate it. Well, thank you. This was an absolute blast. Um, I am a huge, huge fan of your podcast. Uh, and I, uh, hang on, I just want to read this correctly. It's the hands down best podcast ever created. Is that how I'm saying? Is that what I'm thank saying? Thank you. That's yeah, that's yeah. What, uh, yes. full, full, yes. full stop. That's I believe the line what we it gave says. to you. Um, but no, it really is. I, I emailed you guys simply because I'm a huge fan. And um, ever since I heard The Island of Dr. Moreau, which I listen to almost nightly, um, I love it. Uh, but this has actually been really great. And I so appreciate it. And and to anyone out there listening, if you, if you want to really understand who I am, you can go to Instagram and look up uh, hashtag Dave's Down. So um, that's that's the meat and potatoes right there. I highly recommend it. I'm doing it right now. I don't want to spoil really what it is. I really like it. I highly <laughs> recommend it. We'll link to it through the What Went Wrong Instagram as well. Uh, thanks, guys, for listening. Thank you, patrons, for supporting us. And until next time, this has been Chris Winterbauer and Lizzie Bassett with What Went Wrong. Bye. What Went Wrong is a sad boom podcast presented by Lizzie Bassett and Chris Winterbauer. Editing and music by David Bowman, with cover art from Uthana Uos. 